Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. Your support means so much. I am Halima Sharif, and I'm the host and producer for Anything and Everything, the show which acknowledges that everyone has a story. As we know, the month of February is slated as Black History Month. However, I and we celebrate who we are 365 days a year. We have inherited collective wisdom from our ancestors. We adorn the knowledge and sophistication as well as humbly honor those who risk their lives to ensure we have an equitable and prosperous path. Remember, we are not defined by the world, we are defined by excellence. So be the most excellent of human beings and celebrate us this month and beyond as we will have a number of phenomenal guests. Check out the Anything and Everything Media website at www.anythingandeverythingmedia.com for more updates. Meanwhile, I am so excited, and I do mean excited, to welcome our first guest for this month, my friend, my brother, the amazing creative genius, celebrity footwear designer and style correspondent, E2 Evans. Welcome, E2. Hi, how are you? Oh man, I'm doing great. I'm excited that you're here. I'm thrilled to have you joining us this evening. I'm thrilled to be here. You know, E2, I met you, if, I'm not, if I can recall, maybe you can help me. I met you back in 2011 in New York um, when I worked on Wall Street with Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Yes. And when I met you, is that right? Was it 2011? Yeah, it's around that time. Okay. So when I met you a little over 10 years ago, I was dazzled by your style. I was dazzled by your ambiance, your personal Thank essence. You. Yeah, man. You, and look, look at you right now. You're already representing. Hey, I'm on your show. <laughs> oh man, listen, you, 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 it's like you like this 24 seven. And I mean, when I met you back then, I was like, this brother is one heaven of a creative stylist on so many levels. I can just go on and on about your style according you. to etuology, as you call it. But more importantly, you have been blessed. And, I, and I've said this to you before, and I'll say it to you again. You've been blessed with a gift to inspire others with your words of piercing wisdom so I'll stop right there because I really want to go into this interview and I want to read your fabulous bio to everyone. Take it away. Indeed. Celebrity, shoe designer, style correspondent, counterpreneur, and humanitarian E2 Heavens. He's one of the hottest shoe designers in the business. Beyonce bounces in his footwear, Tyra Brain Bank says she's a fan, and Lil' Kim has strapped on some boots for a sexy photo shoot. This proclamation is made by the New York Daily News. E2 Evans is a celebrity shoe designer, founder of Etoology, a luxury cannabis skincare line and Soulsville Foundation. He is dubbed as a lifestyle architect. Footwear News has hailed E2 as the prince of Lux footwear, while New York's Time Out asserts his sexy irrelevant heels have made him a strong contender in the Manolo Blahnik and Jimmy Choo Arena. Now look, for the, for, the, for the record, I can't even wear those high heels. The New York Post affirms E2 Heavens has turned the world upside down on this his stiletto heel. Tim Gunn summed it up in one word, fabulous. E2 is the mark of the fashion coxinti and known by his signature purple bottoms. Emoting his slogan, the Republic of Style, his designs have graced the pages of German Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Spanish Marie Claire, Essence, GQ, InStyle UK, Ebony, 30 Leaders of the Future, and Black Enterprise. Celebrities who have donned E2's designs include Haley Barry, Solange Knowles, Sharon Stone, Queen Latifah, Cynthia Bailey, the late Aretha Franklin, Michelle Michael B. Jordan, excuse me, Eric Benet, and the late John Singleton, to name a few. He has been featured on the hottest designer segment on The View, America's Next Top Model, Good Morning America, Fox 5's Good Day in New York, and Access Hollywood. Fashion writer Jennifer Katui declares E2 Evans' shoes possess an explicable aphrodisiac property, much like the sweets to resistance in chocolate. That says a whole lot. <laughs> E2 received a master's degree in applied behavioral science from Columbia University with a 4.0 GPA. 
He obtained his Bachelor of Science in Social Work and minored in marketing from South Carolina State University, where he was selected as the first Mr. South Carolina State. He continued his education at the Parsons School of Design and later earned an associate's degree in footwear and accessories from the Fashion Institute of Technology. Moreover, he served as an adjunct professor teaching fashion merchandising at Berkeley College in New York. His Soulsville Foundation specializes in global shoe drives and distribution throughout New York, New Jersey, Atlanta, South Carolina, Africa, and the Caribbean. It sponsors shoe art exhibitions, shoe box Santa toy drives, and provides advocacy and awareness for children and youth victims of sexual abuse, trafficking, and passes out soul viral bags to prevent the spread of infectious disease. Soulsville motto is saving souls one step at a time. According to Les Brown, if you have a dream you want to make happen, this is the person you must listen to. The quintessential Renaissance man has been recognized as a man of influence by the National Urban League and the face of Martel Cognac Rise Above ad campaign. He was honored as a Tony Shopping Award recipient from Time Out New York, Crane's New York Small Business of the Year, Bell South Calendar Honoree, and Project Enterprise Entrepreneur of the Year. E2 is a member of Omega Psi Phi. All right, my brother. And recipient of the Fraternity's Second District Citizen of the Year Award. Among his accolades include a public service award by New York State Mayor Andrew Cuomo and a proclamation for outstanding service to the world of fashion by New York State Senator Bill Perkins. All I have to say is wow, wow, and many more wows. Thank you. And, you know, and I'm sure you still have more wows to come. Once again, welcome, my brother. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Oh, man, definitely. You know, you have, you know, just reading that bio and just knowing you personally, um, you have a fascinating story. Very profound. So let's talk about your childhood, your mother, your father, your grandmother. Take me through your childhood. Sure. I believe that childhood is the cradle of our dreams. I'm a behavioral therapist turned shoe therapist. So I believe all of the answers that you want to find. Um, I think the Wendy Williams story was a great example. Even if you don't like Wendy Williams, sometimes we make judgments of all people because we find them at the end of their stage as opposed to the beginning. So people always ask, how did I get you know, interested in shoe design? And really the etymology starts with my family. My grandmother, Queen Esther, uh, my hero would sit me on her canopy bed and she would say, E2, what pair of shoes should she wear to church? So that began to actually shape my sensibility because I was styling her as a kid. You know, I wasn't even 10. You know, I'm like seven, but already my eye has started to advance to understand the difference of how different colors would work uh, harmoniously together, textures. So that's where it started. And sitting in my grandmother's bedroom was an amazing experience for me. Uh, it was the master class before the Fashion Institute of Technology or the Parsons School of Design, because sitting there, all the colors she it, for me it reminded me of sort of like the two train running across the circumference <laughs> of her ceiling it was just shoe boxes just connected just like transit and then on her dresser there were beads cascading off from every hue texture then there were hats piled up in the corner then there was another rack so basically i was immersed my credo was really her room. So I started making flowers to put myself through school because she taught me about flowers and that's how I paid off all of my student loans. So my grandmother was the master teacher to really shape my eye in terms of accessories. And then I started deconstructing shoes. I would take the soles off of my grandfather's shoes out of curiosity so I could understand the construction. And in my mind, I was creating my first driving shoe <laughs> because I noticed that the shoe would go up a little as opposed to being anchored down the toe box by the sole. Now, my mother, on the other hand, 
she loved design also, but she was a little different. My grandmother was definitely all about the heels, you know, even now she talks every week about the heels she wore in her high noon days. So, you know, my grandmother has really fascinated me because her body would change when she put on those stilettos. And that's probably why I partly I'm a behavioral therapist because I always wondered as a kid, what was changing her body and her voice would heighten. Then I realized it was the power of shoes. Yes. And, and Cinderella has taught us that uh, one pair of shoes can change your life forever. Now, my mother in contrast is a dynamic, creative educator, mm -hmm. not your typical educator. My mother could create magic out of construction paper. She could create Disney World. Uh, she was just genius with the equations that she could come up to teach math, several notable accolades uh, for it. But my mother also sort of transitioned my eye, whereas my grandmother raised me up Mm -hmm. to always put women on a pedestal on those stilettos my mother brought me down to keep me balanced to understand practical needs because being an educator she wore primarily flats mm -hmm. so she's like she loves the stilettos for church but what is she going to wear throughout the week so then that kind of shaped my eye for understanding flats and making sure that fashion meets function uh and then my father you know, he was a printer, very talented printer. Um, and then a lot of people know one of my mentors slash pops um, who really taught me how to make shoes, Edson Murray. Uh, so that's pretty much my family uh, dynamic. I have other creatives in the family, celebrity makeup artists, hairstylists um, who do a phenomenal job and are really making an impact um, in the world of design as well. Well, that's interesting. You know, I, I was typing something in, fashion meets function. That, did you say fashion meets or fashion makes function? A uh, fashion meets. Meets function. You know, and just hearing the story of your mom, your grandmother, your grandfather, um, you know, and I'm sure, I don't know how old you were at the time. How old were you when you started noticing all these different changes and the heels and taking your grandfather's shoes and, and taking them apart. How old were you about that time? Probably around eight. Around eight years old, you know, and yes. and I'm did your grandfather, did you just take his shoes or he just allowed you? He saw that gift in you and said, let's see what E2 is going to do with this and let's nurture it. Did he just give you the old shoes that he No, I just went under the bed. I was a very inquisitive child so I was always putting things together uh -huh. and always using the artistic medium yes yes as an amplifier for my voice because I withheld a lot of things and could not really articulate them in the manner in which I thought they would be understood spiritually emotionally as well as creatively so I began to speak through my work Interesting, interesting. And a lot of that foundation was there. You know, a lot of times children, and especially at your age, and who knows, it probably happened before you were eight years old. You know, that, that inquisitive nature, watching your grandmother, wondering what's the science behind the hills and mm -hmm. why does it make you do certain things? Would you say that was your moment that you realized you wanted to be in the fashion industry or you just pretty didn't know what the fashion industry was per se? but you knew you wanted to do something with shoes or just something with making um, some type of artistry? Like, what was, when did you finally realize that? At what age? Well, I would answer the question the following way. Okay. I was on a television program uh -huh. and the anchor asked me, hey, so what do you want to be when you grow up? He had an infamous question. And I said, president of the United States. And he was so awestruck that I would say such a big statement, but I could tell that he didn't really, based on his body language, approve mm -hmm. of me being that ambitious. So I left the studio saying, well, I'm going to own my own business because that way I can be in control mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what other people think. I get to control my narrative. Exactly. So that was my <laughs> focus 
and trajectory at a very early age. Because I believe God bless the child who has his own. You're darn right. That's right. That's right. My mother was always saying, you got to be independent. You have to be a man. A man takes care of his family. A man can take care of himself. So I always had that mindset that I wanted to be a business owner since me expressing I wanted to be president allowed seemed to cause some conflict. So what, so after that, and you realized you wanted to be a business person and you wanted to go into, you know, when, when was that moment that you realized that you were segueing into the fashion zone? Uh, in high school. So take me. Uh, I mean, I was doing fashion shows as a kid wow. for department stores. Um, you know, I've had a lot of hair campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so I was always doing things that were in tandem to design or fashion. So my eye was always drawn to that space. But when I was in high school, and that was given the contrast between my mom, my mom loved interiors, interior mm -hmm. design. Yes. So I was dressing my grandmother, and then she was like, oh, you're not just going to just dress her, you're dressing me too. So then I had to fix my mom's hair, I still style her closet, so all she has to do is go and pick up her clothes, so I'm dressing everybody. But in high school, I started doing flowers, designing flowers. I was working in a department store in college, and I was like, I got to get back home, I got to get back to New York, so I need some money. You know, right now I'm looking a little free rich <laughs> and I need some money. So I started designing flowers uh -huh. and I was like, wait, perspective is everything. They switched me in the department store. I was normally in apparel and they put me in flowers. I was like, yeah, man, I don't want to be in flowers. But then I started to look around. I said, wouldn't that make a dynamic hat? Uh -huh. So I took all the flowers. I asked, could I have them? Because they were throwing them out. I put them on hats. And then I showed them at a fashion show in Manhattan. And the publicist started fighting over them. <laughs> so it pushed my career in design right to the forefront. Now everybody's clamoring over my hats. Wow, man. And then I had floral design. So when you came to my place on 145th Street, you would walk into the E2 Evans experience. There were hats, there were floral arrangements. And then I started doing jewelry like in 1992. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people were shocked now, you know, saying, hey, this jewelry is really gorgeous. You know, when'd you start that? But well, I actually started it in, in 92. I got commissioned to do Iman's, supermodel Iman's birthday jewelry. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a show for Saudis and then Essence and then all of the other publications got on board. So that's really uh, the history of how I actually got into footwear and the fashion industry. So in New York, from the apparel yes. department, taking the flowers, um, and then what happened after that? You know, I know you started segueing not just from jewelry to flowers, but other, talk about your other um, designs, but before actually before we go into that, um, because I think it's important to capture your essence, you know, your personal style, your differentiator. What makes you stand out? And I guess we can touch on the explain the etiology concept. What makes me stand out as a designer or as, a as designer, an individual? As a as a designer. We'll go to the individual. Uh, <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I think what makes me unique as a designer is I understand my value and contribution. And I think every great designer has a strong point of view. Mm -hmm. So I've been very fortunate to be exposed and to travel around the world. So I think I have a unique uh, sensibility in how I blend culture. I think I have a unique uh, sensibility in my design aesthetic, uh, it's very warm and sensual. I like to say that my shoes are Viagra without the side effects. <laughs> and I say that because my designs evoke pedigree, power, and passion. And all of those ingredients, you put that together and you put it on a pedestal, on a, on a stiletto. And I think it makes a pretty strong statement. So what I do as I develop my company in sensibility, 
I like to say that uh, E2 Evans is when you take the, the steel horses of New York City mm -hmm. and you mix them with the English Country Club. And that's the, that's the actual aesthetic that you are seeing. But that's, that's pretty deep, you know, and I'm looking at you and I'm listening to you and I've had these conversations before, but as a, um, I guess another portion of, because we're in Black History Month, you know, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in this space as an African-American male? Well, I would like to say, or I would like to term my experience in this space mm -hmm. as acoustic insanity. Oh boy, that's interesting. You know, you better break that one down. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I say it's acoustic insanity because I'm yelling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but no one seems to hear me. Interesting. Everybody wants me, but no one needs me. Hmm. Everybody sees my value, but nobody initially wanted to pay my worth. The sound of rejection, the, squeak, uh, the squeaking, glaring squeak of oppression mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to hold me back as opposed to pushing me forward, knowing that I'm greater than many of my competitors, but you use my skin as a spider web to tangle me up while you let the others crawl forward. So I had to be really committed and realize that discipline is remembering what you want. Um, it has not been easy. I remember when I was a student at the Fashion Institute of Technology, mm -hmm. um, I won't say who, but someone in power, I told them that someone cut up my designs and they told them, basically told me good, they didn't really care. What do you want me to do? And when Scott Prentice, the president of Bruno Mali, came to the exhibition, he said, this guy's going to be the next great designer. She said, well, let me take you over here. You should look at someone else. Interesting. So I think there are a lot of injustices when it comes yes. to designers of color. It's not that we lack talent. It's not that we lack point of view. It's not that we lack promise we are confronted with fear. The illusion of fear, I believe, is the mousetrap for many designers of color. Because I think the fashion industry as a whole realized that we could always take the cheese. We create it. That's right. You come to our neighborhoods and you emulate our style. So I think those kinds of challenges. So when I first started, people would say, no one's going to pay you two or $3,000 for your design. And they got to come to Harlem oh man, you're bugging, you're crazy. Um, I say, well, maybe I am, but I know I'm not alone. Okay. So I stuck to my mission. I stuck to my sensibility. I took the risk of believing in me. Mm -hmm. And then these girls would come from London and from Europe and from uh, Japan and people would see them coming off of Broadway down the hill. Everybody's, where, where are these people going? And you know, they look so fashionable. And so I would have these swanky garden parties. I had a nectarine tree. I would juice the nectarines. You know, I had them in these incredible chalices. <laughs> uh, I really created the E2 of its experience. And I transferred the same thing when I moved to Wall Street, except I upgraded it with a baby grand piano, sure. a violinist <laughs> to come in, singers from Broadway. And I would have these, you know, incredible celebrity chef. And uh, I would curate the E2 Evans experience so people could understand the lifestyle because I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to create a lifestyle. It's not just shoes. Shoes are carriages. I see shoes as mobile homes. They carry my dreams and they also carry my ideology. So when customers shop with me, you're not just buying a pair of shoes, you're buying a lifestyle, you're buying an experience, you're buying customization, and you're buying awareness. I like that. I love it, actually. So the E2 Evans experience, you just took us through that. But if you had to tell me that in one wild statement, what is that E2 Evans experience? I would say the E2 Evans experience mm -hmm. is a cultural voyage <laughs> into luxury 
I would say that it's progressive with a teaspoon of nostalgia. See, I purposely put you on the spot for that because I love your way with words. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I just knew you were going to go there. I'm going to be like, you know, like, let's ask him, what is the E2 Evans experience? And that just makes you want to know more, more about your work, your designs, more on that differentiator. So talk to me about your work, you know, shoes, um, clothing. I know the different celebrities who have adorned your, your, your style. Talk to talk to us about that. Like take take me through that entire journey, um, because it's, it's quite fascinating. Just reading the bio itself, and just like I said, just having other conversations with you. Um, I know you've spent some time abroad. You know, I know you yep. worked with other designers. So, you know, starting in New York, what are some of the different styles that you've actually designed? Um, take us through that. Well, I would say that my company is the Evans Guild. And we specialize in design, manufacturing, and media consultancy. So when I first started my company in Harlem, I was like, wow, I got to let people know that I exist. So I've always been a very strong writer. So I created a company doing PR called Patois. And I would write up these elaborate press releases, do all of this amazing stuff, and send it out. And then that started to get the attention of stylists, and magazine editors. So that's how I was able to pull everyone into the E2 Evans experience yes. uh, in Harlem. And then I found myself like Richard Pryor, if you've ever seen The Wiz, uh -huh. everybody wants to know who's doing this, who's <laughs> writing this stuff. So I was sort of outed uh, in that kind of way. Uh, so that kind of is what put me on the map and connected me to celebrities because it started with the celebrity stylist. It started with personalities and influences coming to my trunk and garden shows um, in Harlem. Um, the Evans Guild, we have a few brands. We have the E2 Evans brand, which is the signature brand. Um, that's the high-end uh, brand. And then we have the Book of E2, which is exciting. Uh, and the Book of E2 is really what I would consider to be a history book of style. And our slogan is the Swathi scripture of style, Swathi meaning dark. So mm -hmm. we take it there because we realize that there's power in our darkness and that stars have no power mm -hmm. without darkness. So it's the Swathi scripture of style. Um, I consider it to be wearable liberation, mm -hmm. depicting history versus history. So it's the book of E2 versus American history. Man, that's pretty deep. That's pretty deep. Talk, talk about your, um, you know, your different design, your different, different work that you've done with different designers. Well, in Italy, I, because of Tim Gunn, mm -hmm. I was privileged to travel to work with Ducati and did all of their accessories. I was featured on the hottest designer segment of The View. Mm -hmm. And after being featured there, uh, I did a high-end line for Payless, but just in cheaper materials. Wow. That did well. Um, and then I've done a lot of independent design for other shoe companies, like Andrew Stevens, which sold at uh, Neiman's, Nordstrom, and Bloomingdale's. Um, I used to design a lot of stuff uh, in Washington mm -hmm. and uh, the high-end boutiques there as well. Um, and right now I'm working on something called Crown Divine separately. Uh, excited about that. Um, it's pretty much intimate apparel and swimwear for the Divine Nine. So I've never seen that done. And I love being a trailblazer. So we are creating beautiful panty bra sets, lingerie uh, for different fraternities and sororities. Oh, that should be interesting. Yeah, so we're working on, on that. I'm almost finished. Uh, the catch should be done in the next two weeks. And then we start pushing that product. Uh, and with COVID, mm -hmm. the rise of COVID, it's changed my whole scenario. But I'm not complaining. I believe change feels uncomfortable, but change is good. It's necessary. And I'd rather be a butterfly than a caterpillar any day. I totally so I um, am developing luxury sneakers. 
So really excited about it. Just finished the first CAD. It's incredible. I made my first sneaker design. Most people don't know that in 2000. And now here I am looking at these different reports of how stilettos have decreased. In fact, InStyle just did an article by 71%. And that's partly due to cabin fever. We are going out. We aren't going to the theater. We aren't going to Broadway. You know, we aren't going out to clubs and to brunch. So most people now have bought into the casualization of America that COVID has presented. So my focus is to not only design luxury sneakers to compete uh, in that particular area or that niche market, but to also create a sneaker factory in Ghana. So that's another project that we are working full speed uh, ahead on. So very excited about that. Man, that sounds really interesting. You know, um, and speaking of shoes and the sneakers, um, the different celebrities who have um, adorned your wear. So what what wear are we referring to? Was shoes? Was it clothing? Suits? Primarily shoes and handbags, belts. So my specialty is footwear followed by handbags and small leather goods. But I've designed bow ties. Uh, I've designed suits because people always ask me, mm -hmm. how can I get a suit like yours? So I've done bespoke suits. I don't advertise it, but uh, I get a lot of requests for my clothes. And for me, I just enjoy the art and the psychology of design. Sure. It's, it's a medical mood booster that doesn't have side effects. Mm. So, you know, I can enjoy that. And I enjoy bringing that type of joy to others. Because when you feel good, you do good, you move good. That's right. You know, so it all works together. So one of my favorite pictures of you is like the one I've used for the show, the stiletto. Okay. Talk to us about that. That's one heck of a heel, <laughs> literally. <laughs> well, I've developed some signature heels, uh, the harp heel. And I really believe that the heel is really the needle for the record. Uh, so it lifts us up. You know, that's a whole science. If you've seen my TEDx, it really takes you on a fantastic voyage on the power of shoes things that you might have never imagined possible and how they impact your life, your health, how they impact sex, uh, status, and your place in the kingdom, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's right. You, um, you know, I want to talk to you about that TEDx because, you know, I've watched it several times and, and I love it, but I don't want to talk about that right now. I want to okay. talk about your organization, Soulsville. You know, you've done quite a bit for the community and, um, and as it relates to philanthropy, um, as it relates to helping the youth. Talk to me about Soulsville and that organization and also share how, how folks can support you. Okay, sure. Uh, Soulsville is, is dear to my heart. My mother and my grandmother, I've watched them their whole entire lives and currently commit and dedicate themselves unselfishly to empower other people. So it's been ingrained in me. Uh, I don't look at it as a burden. I look at it that we are all connected. And the more we help each other, the more we advance. So teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, I will listen to several stories from my grandmother and my grandfather and they would tell me that when they started courting, as they would say, when they started dating, how they had to walk several miles to be together and to go different places and how they had to put cardboard and linoleum in the bottom of their shoes mm. to protect their feet from getting punctured yeah. from rocks, glass, and other debris. So that's really what drew my attention to creating a foundation that's centered around shoes with the mission of saving souls one step at a time and connecting footprints around the world. Uh, and when you look at shoes, for me, uh, you know, I'm an avid reader. 
I was always moved by looking at, you know, different mediums on television and film. And I would always notice the feet and that shoes were one of the main uh, differentiators, if you will, that separated those who were human, those who were, who were considered primitive or animals. Black people weren't allowed to wear shoes because right. they weren't considered to be full hu fully human. So I was like, you know, I want everybody, <laughs> every person from the diaspora to have a good pair of shoes. Yes. Not only does it protect your feet, it also affects your spine and your alignment. And it also affects your psyche. Mm -hmm. So that's how Soulsville was, was born. And I would say a prayer and I would go out every night when I was a grad student at Columbia University. And I would be divinely led to where to find all of these amazing shoes. A lot of them in mint condition. And then some of them I would actually take back to my shoe repair shop. And we would refurbish them and we would give them to first time job seekers, those who were uh, coming home from serving prison sentences mm -hmm. to, uh, to those uh, organizations that like uh, Dress for Success, Bottomless Closet, those types of organizations, campus, HBCU, uh, campus closets, we would donate shoes and socks to. So Soulsville has, done a ton of global shoe drives from New York to New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, the Carolinas, Atlanta, the Caribbean, Africa, South America, and Soulsville's major uh, goals, well, I would say there are three major things that Soulsville does well. And that's global shoe drives. Mm -hmm. We do what I call sneak peek which is these amazing shoe exhibitions where we take young people and provide art therapy through the form of teaching design. So they use sustainable materials and then it culminates into an amazing exhibition. And some of the proceeds go to them to teach them the power of entrepreneurship and that their ideas have value. So we want to reward them by attaching a monetary figure to that so they could see that the powers here. Yes. Um, and then the last thing that Soulsville does, thirdly, is that we are a siren, a siren for uh, against sexual abuse, mm -hmm. and sex trafficking. Because I work with a lot of young people, and it's just amazing how this is happening right under our noses. And so many of them were abused. So that's why our goal is saving souls, S-O-L-E-S, -E and slash S-O-U-L-S. So saving souls one step at a time. And I love that concept, especially considering um, your background in, in the social work area as well, um, and all the different lives you have touched. But my question is like right now during the pandemic, have, has there, are you all offering anything um, workshops, programs, as we get through the pandemic? Are there, um, yes. Um, we're working on sneak peek. Okay. We have the uh, museum on board. That's awesome. Uh, we have the designers on board, but we are waiting on the organization because it's COVID mm -hmm. to approve everything with the children. Yes, exactly. So, um, that's what we're waiting on, but we've cut, well, we are actually cutting the number back mm -hmm. uh, just to err on the side of caution, but uh, that's definitely happening. And uh, I, I'm going to follow your lead with the questions, but I mentioned the organization that I'm going to be working with in Paris. They brought to my attention that they want to bring it to Indianapolis. Awesome. So probably by the end of the day, uh, that will be solidified, and uh, I will be bringing it with Bernie Martin to Indianapolis. How can people support Soulsville? Well, we take monetary donations because, to be honest, I've been funding much of it by myself, but that's changing this year. But 
we do organizations normally at the end of the year, we have shoebox Santa and people, they, we have an event and people come and they give us money and checks and they bring toys and boxes. Like we did a this huge one out in Queens and probably service 300 kids and families that got toys. That's awesome. So is there yeah, a totally. app? Is there information that they can reach out to you and the organization to, to support? Um, I would say the quickest way that most people have been reaching out is you can find me on IG on Instagram at E2 Evans and you can DM me or you can send me an email. I get a lot of those at E2 Evans at gmail.com. And you can also Google him because he's everywhere. So, <laughs> so let's, um, I, I do have a question for you because you, you know, you have such a, an array of fabulous things that have happened in your journey. What would you say was your most memorable transcending moment as a business, as a business person, business entrepreneur, fashion expert, style expert, all wrapped up in one? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, this may sound simple, mm -hmm. but I would say the most rewarding thing has been having someone to believe in me enough to purchase my dreams. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's you it. know, I, I I don't take it lightly. And my mother always said, nobody owes you anything. But to have something that comes from your heart, that's manifested by your hands, and that for someone to see that, be moved by that, and compelled enough to reach into their bag or their wallet and to purchase it at the price that you believe you're worth is powerful. I agree, you know, and you, you have so much to offer, um, in, not just with your, your style, your abilities, but your gift. You have so many different gifts, um, inspirational gifts. And, and I say that to you often. Um, one of the things I do want to, I want to go back to the TED Talk. Now, I told you this yesterday and I told you again earlier today, I must have watched that so many different times. It's short and sweet. And it's like, pow. But I felt like I was on a journey with you of the shoe. You know, the, the meaning, the understanding, the history, being able to look at someone and tell everything about them from their shoes. I, I encourage you all to watch, I think it's called, what is the theme? Um, leaving a footprint? Leaving a footprint leaving a footprint, just Google on YouTube, not Google, but go to YouTube and type in E2 Evans, leaving a footprint, his TED Talk. Share with us about the TED Talk and anything else after that. Well, I was delighted to receive the call uh, to do it. Um, as you know, the format is very different than speaking for a normal event. <laughs> Yeah. So that was interesting uh, when they said, what do you want to talk about? You know, what's the takeaway? And I said, I'm going to talk about shoes. And they were like, shoes? I don't think we've ever had anyone to talk about exactly. shoes. <laughs> but I was really pleased that when I finished and I exited the stage, she said, outstanding. That was fantastic. Because yeah. I didn't really know where I was going to go. And then three o'clock in the morning, it came to me. Yeah. Do what you... What's your purpose to do on this earth? Leave a footprint. Yes. And I think it's powerful when you can leave the footprint and you don't have to announce what you do because if you leave the footprint, you're leaving a directive, a guide, something symbolic for people to follow. And my goal is to create a legacy, mm -hmm. not just for my family, but for the culture and for anybody, even those who don't look like me, to realize the value of excellence. And if you give your best, you don't have to compete with anybody. You've already won. I agree. I totally agree with you. You know, I can ask you a million more questions, but I asked this question on the last artist circle with um, 
an art a drummer, a well-known drummer who was on the show, Mark Whitfield Sr. And I said, Mark, is there a question that no one has asked you? So I'm gonna ask you too, E2. Is there a question that no one has asked you and you would like to share or ask yourself? Come on. Well, I'm not sure if there's a question that someone has not asked me. I think that people have perceptions of me that are not accurate based upon what they think things are supposed to be. So they don't ask the question, they more so make the statement. And I can infer the question, you know, you don't look like a regular designer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you, you were going to be talking this way. Yes. Or doing that. And I think, uh, you know, and I always say that my goal is never to be put in anyone's box. The only thing I put in boxes are my shoes. So I think the question that is not asked is how are you in the industry? How do you make it being you because you don't look like everyone else? And my answer is my uh, deliverance lies in my difference. Um, I realize the power of being different. Exactly, I like that. Now see, that's one of those quotes I told you about, man. You know, <laughs> and honestly, because I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and you're Omega Sci-Fi, you are the only African-American Q dog that I know personally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm just saying that he is the only one I know. Do you know any others? Uh, sure. Q? I mean, I don't, I don't know personally, but you're the first for me. But, um... But no, I mean, I, I, I think that's it's important because I think a lot of times when you're doing these interviews, you know, whether you're on The View or whatever, you know, not taking away from anything, but, you know, what is that question that, or not even a question, but something that you would like to share? And, and, I, and you're right, you know, the folks have their idea of who a mm -hmm. person is supposed to be based on the industry, whether it's fashion, whether it's finance, whatever it may be. Um, and they just create their own perception of that person. So what would you say, what's on the horizon for E2? Well, after I spoke with you earlier today, I want to make sure I, I wrote this <laughs> down because I just got it. Yeah, because you were excited, um, man. Yeah, I was excited about this. Bernie Martin is a, an incredible designer based out in the Midwest. And uh, he just reached out to me. They're interviewing me for mid -week, uh, Midwest Fashion Week. So Bernie also does this huge fashion week in Paris. So I'm going to be providing the accessories uh, for the virtual Paris Fashion Week, the first week of March, in partnership with El Official Magazine in Paris in the United States. So I'm very excited about this. So my designs, my neckwear, my jewelry, my handbags, all my accessories will be complementing Bernie's incredible collection, as well as some other designers who have the opportunity to pull from me and my team as well. I am the lead for Beyond the Return in Ghana, which means I am the only American-based designer who is going to be leading design in, in Ghana for this initiative. And on board is Lamar Rucker, Place Jacob, as you know, and Greenleaf, uh, Baron Davis. It just has an incredible cast of talent. Awesome. And I'm just thrilled and honored to represent the fashion side of that, as well as the interior design side of it. So it's uh, thrilling. And then I'm working on the new sneakers and the sneaker manufacturing factory that we are looking to raise monies for now. Yes, and once again, you all, you can, to support him, you can check out his IG and where again? All the different places. At E2 Evans. Exactly, so. Yeah, E2 Evans on uh, Instagram, on Facebook, and the email is e2evans at gmail.com. What advice would you give young people today? Uh, I would say 
the advice that I would give young people today is never allow people who can't afford you to shortchange you of your worth and dreams. Hallelujah. Listen, I totally agree with you. Um, as an entrepreneur, you know, I always tell folks, especially being in New York for so long, and I would always tell folks that I can't afford to work for free. Yes. You know, you know, and I'm not saying that there aren't times when we give, you know, of course. to support our community. But at the end of the day, you, you know, we all have wonderful gifts that are given to us. And we, you know, entrepreneurs work. And many entrepreneurs yes. don't have a nine to five. And so, you know, we depend on that. So what you said is more than a mouthful. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people will really try to discount you. You know, I get every day, everybody says, E2, I wear a size 12. E2, I wear a size 8. I said, everyone is giving me the numbers except the numbers that I need from their credit cards. <laughs> and that's what, that's my reply. I said, now give me your credit card number. That's funny. <laughs> and we can talk. So listen, did you design your little, the, the tie and everything else you have on? Do you have any, any, any work? around you that you want to share i i could grab something for you uh, go ahead, quickly go ahead i want to i want to go ahead i want to go ahead break on some of your so stuff i can grab something hold on So this is a custom dyed Python duffel bag. Ooh, I want to I want to reach through the screen. That has the E2 logo on it. Let me see the the logo. Did you just say Python? Yes, it's custom dyed yellow python. Have, have mercy. And <laughs> this. Oh, man. Beautiful. Yeah. I can put a bunch of stuff in that bag. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> with, with women, there's never a bag big enough. What's your What's your take on that? When you're when you're making handbags. <laughs> There's never, and then we call ourselves trying to be all cute and have the little bitty purses and all go into the little balls and it's still not enough for them. Oh man, I like that. What is that made out of? A suede? So this is a booty and it's done in suede. Love it. Oh, those colors. Uh, I just grabbed something walk, quickly. That's, see, that's just an, a, a hill for me to walk in where I won't fall. <laughs> uh, Here's the suede studded boot. Oh, that's sick. Wow, look at them. And uh, it has the signature purple bottom. Now that's sexy. It has the Greyhound on it. And then I wanted to show you something that's athleisure. Yes. And it has the E2 cutout on the side. Snowbound? So. I believe that there's no weather condition that E2 Evans cannot make you look stylish in. Hey, let me see so that I'm again. I'm going to just grab. <laughs> I, I like that last one. Let me see that again. That's pretty cool. Oh, this one? Yeah. Man, I love it. I love it. Well, actually, I, I did it in black, and I was in D.C. speaking at a political, a political event. Yes. And then something at Howard. And then somebody's like, Michelle Obama would love that. So then I was like, maybe I need to start working on Abuja. So yeah. now I'm at the point. I love Michelle Obama. So yes, definitely. I've even created a bag, man, uh, in tribute to her and 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 Oprah, and Barbara Streisand. Those are three women that I um, I love and uh, the sensibilities. Also, Iris, you know, obviously. But I'm going to grab a necklace just so you can see sure. some neckwear. Definitely, definitely. I'll be right back. Sure.
I didn't. I wasn't aware that she wanted me to show some things. So this is anything and of, everything. So you never know what may happen on the show. Well, but <laughs> uh, I'm just grab. I just grabbed a few pieces. Sure. Okay. I believe if you stay ready, you won't have to get ready. Exactly. Oh, so no, that. that's two necklaces here. That's beautiful. And then I want to show you. Gorgeous. So this is one of my favorites, and it's made out of coral. Hope y'all paying attention. Beautiful. So, in in tribute to you and the lovely ladies of Alpha 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 Sorority Incorporated. I'm gonna have to purchase that. I know you could Skiwi. appreciate oh, a man. little skeevy color beautiful. scheme. And do you have any um, shoes to match that with some heels that I can wear? I'm sure some of my other sorors could probably wear shoes that are much more. Of course, we have something for everyone. Look at that. We do all heights, you know, as long as it's luxury, we're in. I love it. I should put this one on so you could actually see it. But yeah. this looks amazing on. What? I'm going to put it on the display form so you could. It looks heavy. Really see very it? light. Very, very light. Not heavy at all, actually. So E2, are you, are you, um, where can we purchase? Once again. Uh, you could contact me. Normally what I do is I do trunk shows. Okay. So with this pandemic, yeah. we just lower the number now and we try to space it out to do like 10 people, 10 to 15 people. And then we do it uh, like every other hour. So it's in different spots in New York? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So definitely I'm gonna get more information from you on that is like, when is the next one, two, three, four? Sure. This is my monogram. This is what it looks like individually. This is on lambskin, if you can see this. Yep, I can see the texture. So it has a greyhound and the E2. I love that. Intersecting. And then this is what it looks like when it's actually in the official color. If you could see that, if you need to see it in a singular presentation, that's what it looks like. And then it's just multiplied. So I'm looking at your designs and I'm looking at you. Yes. What, what is it that inspires the different designs, the culture wise? Regions, mixture mm -hmm. of, is it a mixture of re regions, personality? Like, what is it that inspires you when you put when you put the work into a certain design, even that logo itself? Well, the logo, I chose the Greyhound for several reasons. When I envisioned my company, I said, I need a design, a logo that really spoke to what I wanted to project historically, mm -hmm. uh, culturally, and spiritually. So the greyhound is how I see myself. It's a visionary animal. It's a sight hound. Mm -hmm. So I removed the eyes from my greyhound and I had him to look like this, like he's looking back at my name, like as I'm calling him. And I was like, if he's a sight hound, he doesn't have to have eyes. And I was thinking mm -hmm. like Interesting. Helen Keller, a lot of people have eyes, but how many have vision? That's right, that's right. So that's why he is, uh, taking on that particular stature and how and why he's looking back. I said, I want to add spots. He's not a Dalmatian because I want him to be very distinctive. I don't want him to, to blend in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, you think to, to be accepted, you have to blend in. I and mean, most people don't have the courage to be themselves. They're looking for someone to follow. Mm -hmm. So I envision him as a leader. And then culturally, uh, if you look at the history of the hound, we found the hounds and the pharaoh hounds on the pyramids mm -hmm. in Egypt. That's right. And then Cleopatra, I said, well, I need something because I was always fascinated with Paris and London and Italy being the fashion meccas that everyone talks about. If you could get there, then you've proven yourself. 
well, if you look at the history of Cleopatra, she took the Italian Greyhound, which is an African dog, to Italy to give him to Caesar as a gift because to have Greyhound, to have a Greyhound is to have a luxury being because Greyhounds don't bark. They're not used for protection. That's right. They had cats that would descend uh, off of the buildings onto the intruder's head for protection. So it spoke to luxury. And then I studied, you know, the horses and the hound piece, which creates that uh, aristocratic a regal sensibility. Mm -hmm. And then biblically, the Greyhound is the only dog that's mentioned by name uh, in the Bible. And it says there's nothing more majestic in pace than a Greyhound or a king that's not at war. So those are some of the reasons that I selected the Greyhound. And then just in layman terms, when you see a Greyhound, if any dog was selected to represent the fashion industry, it would be a greyhound. It's tall and slender. It's it's regal and statuesque. So those are some of the reasons, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That I, I chose the greyhound. I love it. I love it. Man, this has been quite a bit of a history lesson for me. I feel like every time I talk to you, I'm learning something new all the time. Um, E2, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Man, I, I really do for your contributions to the industry, um, your hard work, humanity, your community, and so much more, man. Keep it Thank moving. You. you know, you you are you are the man, you know, and I'm very proud to know you. Um, I look forward to to supporting you and to having you on the show again in the future. Absolutely. I'll be back with the sneaker and to show you what the Crown Divine lingerie looks like as well. Yeah, I can't, I can't that wait. That may be a clip from Paris Fashion Week. Listen, you, I, you, I hope so. Definitely, man, definitely. You know, I'm looking forward to all that. Well, everyone, this has been Anything and Everything's Artist Circle with the amazing E2 Evans. Stay tuned and stick around for a special little treat, a little something from E2. Thank you. Also, the last P, the price of shoes. I know what you're thinking. I'm not going to give you the 800, the 200, or your pay less. Choosing the wrong pair of shoes can cost you more than what you paid for it. However, the biggest problem comes when we actually fall in love with the style of the shoe and not the fit. We often shortchange ourselves by shopping for shoes at the wrong time of the day. You should always shop for your shoes at the end of the day, and your measurement should be taken according to your largest foot. Failure to do so will give you what I call the E2 vegetable melody. Corns, onions, and bunions with a hot side of blisters and calluses. Now, there's a question that I've been waiting to ask you, been itching in fact. How many of you, by a show of hands, own more than five pair of shoes? Wow, your bonus P is privilege. Did you know that over 600 million people worldwide don't own one pair of shoes? That's why I created my Soulsville Foundation to save souls one step at a time. Now, I know you're sitting there and you're probably saying to yourself, what am I going to do with all of this shoe stuff? Well, the next time you go shopping, I want you to remember three Ps. Well, actually, three things. I gave you four Ps. The first is, what do my shoes say about me? Are these my size or just my style? And ultimately, what footprints am I leaving behind? Because someone may just want to walk in my footsteps. Remember, shoes are the diaries of our lives. Captured in real time, step by step by step. Thank you.